Hi, Sue Morrison here from Your Teen Media. And today I'm with Dr. Linda Charmaraman, who's the director of the Youth Media and Wellbeing Research Lab at the Wellesley Centers for Women, a research and action institute at Wellesley College. Her research follows middle school students and their parents in order to determine the long-term health and well-being effects of early smartphone use, social media use, and gaming. So her expertise is what we are all searching for understanding about. So thank you for being here. Um, and, you know, we are in unusual circumstances and kind of the rules that we lived by for the last few years are different right now. So are there any hard and fast rules for middle school kids that you would suggest to parents while we are in this quarantine environment? in my um, studies with middle school parents, one of the, the main concerns that they have is that they wish they knew what everybody else was doing because they don't know if they are strict, they don't know if they're lenient, they don't know if it's, uh, if it's normal for their sons to be on it for 10 hours a day and their girls to be on, you know, curating their photos, taking so long curating their photos. So, um, so I think it's it, not just about how you are in relation to other parents, but how do your rules sort of fit with your, with your children? You know, like, like some of them could be um, experiencing some anxiety at the moment because of not knowing what their future holds, um, maybe uh, restricting the type of content that they see, making sure that the news that they're seeing is real news, for instance, or making sure that they, they know that there's, there's resources you know, out there um, online that could help them um, feel less anxious as opposed to more anxious, you know, like meditation apps and things like that. So, so I think a, a lot of the key um, isn't just um, the amount of time that you're on um, technology, it's the content that is consumed. So you would recommend parents of middle school kids to really be watching what their kids are doing online? I think it's, it's probably not uh, feasible to be co-viewing all the time, like in the old days. And they, they would say, you know, the best thing about TV is, you know, when you co-view and you get to talk about things, you know. Yeah. But at least in this day and age, you know, I mean, there's a lot of people who subscribe to, for instance, YouTube channels, you might want to check out which YouTube channels that you would approve of, you know, ones that are age appropriate, ones that, you know, might not have the content that you'd be worried about, you know, like violence and profanity and, you know, pornographic, you know, um, content, that kind of thing. So, um, so I think also it's not just the content of external parties, but also who do your kids follow? Who are their friends in their network? You know, so so that's something that um, it's it's not that you would want to have to prove every single person, but to kind of know what the what the impact is of certain people um, being on your teens' news feeds and on your teens, you know, snap, you know, stories. So <laughs> I'm curious. So you're talking, you're doing research with teens and parents, right? With middle school girls, kids, and parents. So how much do they match up in their storytelling? Like, you know, I say that, uh, you know, my house has no rules and, my, and the kid that you talk to says, we have more rules than anybody else. <laughs> um, well, we did interviews and surveys with teens and their parents. And especially in the interviews, if you ask people directly about their rules in the house, I find that it's hard for parents to be completely honest about the rules and if they've imparted the rules in their head that seems so ideal in their head and do they actually say it and enforce it to their teens and then when you ask the teens they'll say things like oh yeah that's a rule but they don't even do it themselves you know <laughs> they're on their phones at meal time too so um so i think it's 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 very common for rules to kind of be um, sort of fluid in some situations. Um, and well, I think like it, there's a little bit of, it, of this aspirational parenting and then the reality of it. How realistic is it for you to be monitoring which hours are school time and which hours are social media time and which hours are gaming time? It's like, it, it's just impossible. So, you know, we can all talk the aspirational talk of what we should be doing, but in reality, it's probably the most challenging thing to monitor of anything that we've ever experienced with our kids. Absolutely. I think um, when you think about what is 
workable for us in this time, I think it has to do with more um, looking for signs that something's not working. So if something seems to be, the, the mood is going well, there's peace in the family, you know, there's, they're, they're, they're um, engaged and they're not completely miserable and lonely, then you're probably doing something fine. Everything is just fine. But if you start to notice somebody feeling, um, you know, having addictive um, tendencies, having experiencing withdrawal, like you can't, they can't get off the game, they can't get off of that, that's that YouTube channel, and they have um, disagreements with family, and they, they're, they're skipping meals, they're, they're not sleeping, those are the kind of things that, that would probably need some intervention, but, but if things are going well, um, you know, just kind of keep going with with what works. There's a lot of different styles of parenting for for media. You know, there's the the kind that's about restricting um, its its availability. So you would just have a curfews and you would take the device away. Um, there's the surveillance kind of parenting where you could uh, be that's like monitoring. that's monitoring the monitoring yes, devices. That's, that's sort of like the the secretly looking through people's yeah. texts and um, having, you know, web, website, you know, logs of what were they browse and things like that. And then there's the communicative parenting where you wanna actually have conversations about where they should go and what they've been seeing and how things are going. Um, and so there's a lot of different types that could fit for different families. One of the things that I think maybe not, you know, 10 years ago, but for sure now, I hear experts say over and over again, if there is ever a rule that everyone should do, it's that you take the phones before they go up into their bedroom. So, mm -hmm. but does research reflect that, that parents are in fact taking phones and, and technology away from their kids before they go up to their room or is that not necessarily true? Well, it is true that the American Academy of Pediatrics um, recommends that you, know, you take them away 30 minutes before they actually go to sleep. Um, but 80% of teens sleep with their phones. So, you know, they're under their pillows, they are hearing the notifications all night, they want to get to that text, that important piece of news. So, I mean, there's the recommendations, of course, of the pediatricians, but, you know, in households, it's, it's one of those things where I think a lot of people use it as a privilege, and a privilege is taken away when something, you know, they don't do something that makes their parent happy. So, um, I think I think that it's the same thing for um, it's about it's about the content too. So it, it it depends on are you looking at you know horror stories about COVID nineteen right before bed and you're not be able to sleep, or are you looking at ways to meditate to help you sleep? I mean, those are two different reasons to use your phone before before bed, and it's all about if that content is gonna keep you healthy or not in a way. It's a little bit like sleep where there are best practices, but few of us have the power to impose it. Um, so, you know, there's a lot of the stories that we hear are about girls who are spending too much time on social media and boys who are gaming too much. So what are there signs to look for where in fact it is getting to be an addiction and a problem? Yeah, I mean, uh, in the case of boys and gaming, I mean, there's a lot of girls gaming nowadays too. Um, some of the things that are um, a negative sign is that if, you know, gaming itself isn't necessarily uh, negative to, you know, somebody's health or well-being or mental health. Um, there are studies that violent games though do increase aggressive thoughts and aggressive behaviors. So if, if there are kids that are getting aggressive when they're told not to game anymore, that would be one, one sign. Um, nowadays, there's a lot of ways to not just have that stereotypical view of a gamer by themselves with their headphones and, um, you know, just sort of um, alone and, and ostracized and, 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 you know, don't care about any other activity. There's actually more, more socializing nowadays with the advent of different social media sites, you know, like Discord, where you can just chat and hang out with your friends while you're strategizing about the next move and how you can take down the, the competitors. And sometimes they sneak in, oh, what's for homework today? I, I missed it, you know, I missed it in so-and-so's class. And this is how boys are different from girls in that they like to do activities as they socialize. And sometimes gaming, that's their activity of choice. You know, if not um, shooting hoops, I can't do that so much nowadays, but there's games, you know, that they can do. Um, 
And so I think it really has to do with um, are they able to continue their social life and feeling like connected to the world while they're gaming? Well, how, how about when those kids do cross over? Like we'll talk, we'll continue the conversation about boys. They cross mm -hmm. over that line um, and, the, and the parents know that something's wrong. Like you, you get this feeling like they're too combative when you say come to dinner. They, you know, they can't pull themselves away. Mm -hmm. Then what do you do? In some households I've noticed, that if the parents are also gaming with them, they can understand where their world is at. I mean, go ahead and go hang out with them. See, instead of having this stereotyped view that, oh, this is too violent, this game doesn't have anything redeeming about it. But maybe if you go in there and you start playing with them, you realize, oh, it's about teamwork and collaboration and about you know, strategy, um, then you can, you can get to that place where you could both think about how to set limits. You know, oh, you know, how, you know, you know when you were, feeling that way, you were starting to get moody about that point in time, let's talk about that. And we can talk about how next time we can, we can really, you know, ransack that castle in a different way. Um, but also talk about social emotional um, aspects of gaming, which is really hard to infuse in everyday conversation, you know, <laughs> the social emotional aspects of their, their lives. Sometimes at gaming could be a, a nice excuse to talk about it. <laughs> That's great. And that leads to our last question, which is such a thank you for the segue. What's the good news? There's certainly wonderful things that technology has given us. So what are the, the highlights of the good news that you see in your research? Well, um, one, one interesting thing is that since the, a lot of the lives that adolescents lead are online anyway, um, being physically distant from their classmates might not be as traumatizing as the adults in their lives are feeling for their own lives because they a lot of times um, the physical um, is, is not something that is, is at the top of the kids' minds when they're, when they're constantly online anyway, and they're already hanging out. They already have the mode of communication down pat, and now they, they can get even more creative about group chats and group parties and things like that. Um, there's so many ways in which online um, communication has been maligned in terms of like all the negative, you know, cyberbullying and, and inappropriate content that, that you're, you're seeing online. But there's also a lot of um, resilience, a lot of providing support to each other in which um, is not accessible to people who are geographically far apart from places that would really understand them you know, um, like if you had a certain medical condition or maybe you're, you're an LGBTQ youth and you don't have mode of transportation to go to support groups, you know, being on social media could be your lifeline. Um, raising awareness about uh, social issues that you care about, you know, this could be a, a great way to you know, gather, you know, troops to try to help you with your cause and raise awareness. Um, and I, I just think that Social media is made to be social. So when media is used to, to be less social, to isolate yourselves from other people, that's when, when technology itself could be a hindrance to healthy development. So as long as you're using it to be social and connect with other people, um, there's a lot to be gained. So thank you so much, Dr. Linda Chamaraman. Really appreciate your time and your wisdom and um, you know, great takeaways for us. So thanks for being here. Thank you, Sue. Good to be here too.